Hi, I'm Mark Henderson from Laramide Resources. We're a Toronto-based uranium development company, and I'm here in London to have a chat with Matt. How are you? Do you know what the funny thing is? You were one of the last live interviews that we did for COVID, and now you're one of the first. That's, no. that's nice. That's a long, long time. It's uh, hard to believe. That's a few years of our lives lost, but anyway, I don't want to lie to me. Well, it hasn't all been bad. You've been uh, moving the project along, right? Yeah, it's very positive. I never thought we'd have a bull market like we've had in a in a market that with COVID and recovering from COVID. But nice time to come back. Nice time to come back. So you're obviously referring to, uh, I guess, the recent um, boost with SPUT, SPOT Physical Uranium Trust. Also, I guess we're seeing a little bit of uh, yellow cake revival and of the new big boy in town is the ANU. Uh, guys um, with the Kazatomprom project. So welcome addition to the team, right? Yeah, well, I mean, all, all the markets have been fabulous. The energy markets are obviously a real standout. And within energy markets, I think people have really caught on that there's something going on with this uranium thing. Yeah. Um, and, we, you know, you reference SPUT, but I mean, that's that sort of uh, vehicle to capture physical pounds and sort of sequester them and basically... I wouldn't say short squeeze the utilities, but they've certainly got the attention of the utilities. Yeah. And I think that the move that we had that probably took six weeks, I think most of us would take, thought would take six or nine months. So a lot of us are really, we're on our toes now, we're moving, it's time to get, get things rolling, it's right? So a Phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. But the, as you say, the, it's interesting you mentioned it, the energy market as a whole, quite frankly, we've had problems over here with gas and gas prices, and it's we've seen lots of uh, these intermediaries sitting out at over 20 go bust here in the UK alone in the last four months. It's, it's, a real, it's been a real problem. And we've seen the sort of geopolitics of, of Russia engaging with Europe over their Nord Stream 2 projects as well, and prices going up across the board. So nuclear is back on the agenda. It's, it's okay to talk about nuclear as far as politicians are concerned. It's really it? back on the agenda. Yeah, I mean, I think though, the West really slept walked into this energy crisis in, in really all forms of energy. If you talk about oil, if you talk about nat gas, if you talk about uh, uranium, um, you had a little hiccup with renewables, obviously, in the UK with the wind thing in the summer, but it focused everybody's attention on it. You know, and I, and I think that's really was it. That was a factor that I don't think we were expecting. I mean, I think in terms of the fact that we would have eventually the bear market would end in uranium and it went on for 10 years. And so you know, give us a year or two anyway of a good market. I think the big factor this time that is kind of the overarching thematic that that we didn't know would come into play is this whole interplay between the energy crisis it connected to this, you know, the COP, zero emissions and everything else. And so nuclear is quickly, a lot more quickly than I thought from a public opinion standpoint, and maybe the energy crisis was helpful to that. Um, and suddenly people are going, uh, they're trying to understand where does this come from? I need to understand it. I need to understand why I have this energy price in my own home. I mean, you mentioned these people that have gone out and they tried to buy energy security and it didn't work, right? So I think you as taxpayers in England are probably covering that for the winter or something, aren't you? <laughs> I don't know who's covering, but it's not the British government. They're saying you're on your own. Um, a couple of points there. You may, the, these kind of synthetic financial companies which have come in and, as you say, they've kind of inserted themselves into quite a small market in, in reality. So it's not hard to be influential. Because before, you know, back two years ago, you and I were talking about the supply-demand economics, right? So in terms of what's changed there, on the supply side, COVID has affected um, the, the output. The supply has reduced. We've seen uh, nuclear take front and center um, with a lot of uh, countries now. You know, we, we, we've got, it used to be just, you know, France, US, a bit of China. China's announced recently $400 billion investment into building 150 new reactors. I sat up and uh, paid attention to that because that, you need to feed the beast. Where's that coming from? Just so tell was, us that one mind, story. That was a mind-blowing number, to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, the, the, the thing that really would underpin, if you like, a real thematic that drives people beyond their little sector and gets everybody's attention and that drove uranium from seven to 135 before. In the last cycle, we had the what became to be known as the nuclear renaissance. And the nuclear renaissance was really driven by the fact that China said, we're going to be a nuclear nation, partly to clean up the air and but obviously to deal with the fact that they had some serious energy issues and demand going forward and everything else. Yeah. And so that really kind of underpinned it. And so I, when I said we didn't really have a, a big driver thematic 
before this energy crisis plus zero emissions thing kind of happily came together this at miraculously at the same time that sput was happening that's a bigger driver i mean any market that goes from financially from x to 3x is going to get adherence and it's going to get interest but people are often looking you get a lot of fast money and people are instantly trying to get off the train and i think what people are realizing now is we have a big long prolonged market that's underpinned by some serious fundamentals that are about something really important to everybody which is energy and how they get energy and how we're going to get energy in the future so it's a you know it's it's a happy coincidence when that kind of thing works out you know with the investments that you're talking about or the companies that you're involved in but you, you've got Kazakhstan or Kazatom prom through the fund doing deals with the Chinese government which means that Kazatom prom product is no longer going to be available to the not just the utilities but any of these intermediaries who've sat on these traders who've been flooding the market with this mobile inventory that's that's probably going to be gone now the knock-on effect for that is great for companies like you, not so good for the utilities. When do they wake up and actually start making some decisions? When do, when do the contracts start coming? Oh, I think they're, I mean, I don't want to say the utilities are panicking because you'd never notice it. It'd be a very slow motion panic with the way the utilities react to things and the way they make decisions and things like that. But there's no doubt about it. There'd be a lot of meetings being held. There's a lot of concern now about it. The Kazakh thing in particular. So the big organizational thing for the nuclear industry is this WNA World Nuclear Association Conference, which is typically held here in London, actually on the other side of the bridge. We're sitting here, on, you know, right by Westminster. Um, and they didn't have that live this year, but there was a presentation done by by Kaz Adamprom actually that didn't get a lot of attention. And it's also because it's one of those conferences where unless you're a member and it's 1,500 pounds and you're part of the club or something, yeah. the, the the presentations and what have you don't get widely disseminated. But there was a slide by Kaz Adamprom that I think was picked up in that Bloomberg article that talked yeah. about, yeah. you know, China's really going to go from 60 gig to 200 gig, which is what they were doing. And they said, basically, in a nutshell, there may not be enough to go around, just so you know, between all this physical and what we've already committed to. And they obviously have made some serious geopolitical commitments to the Chinese in their next, the existing buildup, but also the next level of buildup. We don't know the terms of that, no. but I, 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 I'm not sure if it's going to be the same page of the, uh, of the same presentation, but page four was one I noticed where it said, if, if we do no more exploration, we, by 2030, we are, will be 50% of our current production level, so down to 30 million pounds. That's another big one for me. I missed that one. I mean, I had sort of yeah. thought that, and I'd seen a technical presentation from their folks in Toronto at the PDAC a couple of years back. Yeah. And they were very candid about, you know, we're ripping through the good stuff, the good minds, the good grade. We have lots of it. We're at 60 million. I, that was not a sustainable number. They went to about 45 to 50. So where they dial back to, who knows? They do have presumably ex some expiration potential sure. and, and everything else. It's a big area. But there's no second Kazakhstan. There's nothing that resembles on the planet the, the geological endowment that they had when they started. And they really only started um, really in the, in the 2007, 2008, because the Russians had essentially found all of that stuff to support the Russian nuclear uh, programs, you know, civilian nuclear, et cetera. And they'd never really gotten around to, to, to developing it. And so they've effectively gone through a lot of that stuff without re either reinvesting a lot in exploration or electing not to do exploration for whatever reason, because obviously we have a massive endowment to start with and you don't have to worry about it. But I'm interested to see, see that if they're talking about starting to do exploration, it's obviously meaningful. All, of, all these little, you know, these little smoke signals should be sort of seen by people. But it used to be, it used to be the case. Again, when we first started talking, even up until, you know, six months ago, lots of these little countless moments, they came and they went and they didn't add up. They didn't add up. They should have added up, but they didn't. And the people just ignored them and moved on. I think the energy crisis, I'm going to call it energy crisis. We've seen what's happened with the kind of fossil fuel conversation, coal and obviously oil and gas. Uh, you know, it's capturing the, the attention and minds of the right people now. But the, the bit that also, uh, as well as mopping up all this mobile inventory, the bit that kind of caught my imagination was here, you've got Russia, Kazakhstan, the geopolitics of uranium and nuclear has always been interesting uh, to me. Does this sort of signal perhaps a kind of bifurcation of the marketplace or is it just going to be more harmless than that? Because I do remember the kind of antagonistic and con uh, confrontational um, language being used when I first came back into uranium about two years ago. It was US, it's 
versus Russia. It's us versus them. All of that sort of stuff. Do you think this is the beginning of that again? I don't know about that. I mean, the, the people, the, the security supply thing was always something you should have worried about. You only had really had to worry about it, though, if you own a nuclear power plant. And because they have in, big inventory buffers, they didn't worry as much. But I think all these developments together are starting to make people realize that, you know, 2030 is tomorrow in terms of the reserve. So I think what I had mentioned before about the reserve life, because the reserve life, if you looked at it over the last five years, it was pretty clear the reserve life couldn't support the existing plants that were already built and out of the ground, never mind the ones that were under construction and planned. And so I think you finally have that eureka moment that everybody says, we better do something about that. And they're starting to do it even now in some of the other metals because they all, it's strange, but it's like parts of the business world don't talk to the other parts of the business world. So the car makers want to make all these electric cars, but only after they've announced these massive plans, they go out and go, mm, maybe there's not enough lithium, maybe there's not enough cobalt, where are we going to get it? And what's the price? And so those conversations, seem to start to be happening now as well. It's important. Yeah, we, we actually, it's important. It's an important industry, mining, but it's a very small industry. In fact, someone said that they reminded me, Apple is bigger than the entire mining industry. Every single yeah, company in, in there, it, that's how small it is. But it's, 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 always, it's important. It's always been important, but maybe not getting the you know, share of voice in terms of certainly not investing it. Um, but look, let's, let's talk about you and your projects. And maybe a little bit of politics. I've noticed that you are doing a little bit of work in the Northern Territories, Australia. When we last spoke, we talked about some of the states which are pro-Uranium, not pro-Uranium. Do you think conversations from the COP26 will change the minds of Australian politicians? Or are you still battling a little bit with the sort of Queensland project? Uh, well, I wouldn't say we're battling. We really haven't re-engaged, if you will, because it didn't make sense to re-engage at $30. I mean, we... We always plan to re-engage when the price got to a level where it made sense to say, hey, there's this project. You know, when, okay. your, when your predecessor government was there, they were going to let it go. They made a big but, deal you know, about you know, mining it's uranium. Kind of pointless conversation because no one's listening. But the point is, do you think now, it, with this new narrative, this new drive, that it is time to maybe sound them out? Oh, I, I think that moment is approaching. And so I can, I can tell you that the media exploded in Australia on the back of the submarine deal that was done that people may or not know about. But the Americans are the first time licensed. You know, Americans nuclear and the submarine and the Brits. Sorry, I don't know. The Brits went, went in my, there. My, my apologies. <laughs> Gazumped the French. <laughs> yes, because apparently we're going to do diesel submarines or something. Anyway, that that that, right. that didn't happen, and so they've licensed the nuclear technology to uh, to the Australians, which was obviously quite provocative geopolitically. But in Australia, that caused a big uproar because it didn't used to be you could even land a nuclear submarine without a lot of yeah. permission and hullabaloo ahead of time and. The Australians were that sort of, a, they had that much of an uh, ideological idea about whether they liked it or didn't like it. But it basically, on the, on, the, on the ground about uranium mines, it's only devolved to two states that say they, they don't really like uranium mining, and it's not in law. So the assumption is that either they're, be, they're not the permanent government, or and it's a two-party system, and the other lot will be in, and then you'll be fine. And that's what happened in Western yeah. Australia, and happened in Queensland, just not long enough. We had one term instead of two. Yeah. And... But I do think that it's clearly on the agenda. And the one thing I have heard, there's also a federal election coming up. So all this, but, and also, uh, I think it's in April or May. Okay, so like 2022, April 2022. May. 2022. And both parties, both parties in Australia are pro, at the federal level are pro-Uranium. Right. So there's no issue there and there's no issue with exporting Uranium, which is what the feds have to give you the sign off for. Mm. But it's more about the, well, the mining on the ground and uh, you know, the, the, the states control the resources. Right. and the sign-offs on the environmental permits and things like that. And so you've still got two where they say, well, we don't really like it, but there's no law, and there's no, therefore there's no law to change. There's just, a, there's just an announcement by the party in power that says, you know what, we changed our mind. We've looked at everything. And I do think, to answer your question about COP, I do think all of the climate change thing, that really got a huge audience with this, and there's all sorts of folks now that are advocating for nuclear being part of the solution. And so I think there's no doubt that that will resonate ultimately in Australia. And what I've heard about the election, because I think the federal parties, since they are basically have the same uranium policy, mm -hmm. I think they've sort of they've sort of said, well, we don't really want to bring it up unless you, the you, the Labor Party, nationally are going to be open to it, because the I guess the thinking is partly that they could, national party could just call the state parties and go, you know, it's time mm -hmm. to 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 get with the program and 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 get with the, where the opinion polls are going on this, yeah. but whether that's going to happen or not, I don't know. So I can't tell you whether it will be an issue nationally or not. But I, they are talking in the in the media in Australia. It's a subject of conversation, like if not weekly. When, when the first story first broke, it was daily. But there, it's 
it's back in the public consciousness again. I, it definitely is, but I guess the slightly, <laughs> The, 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 it's, it's kind of mind amusing in a way, the fact that when something gets a little bit expensive, suddenly it's okay again, right? So energy's got expensive, people are going, I really don't like these costs, right? Uh, there's not another technology solution which can deliver what, what nuclear can, so maybe it's okay to start talking about this again. You know, it's, it's like saying, I remember this survey two years ago in the UK, it was like, would you, if you had renewable energy, would you mind paying more for your electricity? Oh yeah, not a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course we would. <laughs> and then what's happened is the renewable energy prices, we stopped being subsidized, the prices have gone up. And people are like, well, hang on, what, what happened here? We, I, I didn't ask for this. Well, you, apparently you did. <laughs> so, the, you know what I mean? So money, money, money talks. And in, in this case, I think, uh, I'm not quite sure what the situation is uh, with energy prices in Australia, but we've certainly seen them across, across Europe and people's attitudes changing towards nuclear, uh, partially as a result. They're being a little less impacted by this whole energy crisis idea in Australia. But the, the one thing that where they do, where this really would benefit them, though, of course, is that Queensland is a heavy coal thing and they're still licensing new coal mines. I mean, there aren't many, there are very few countries in the West yeah. where the government would be advocating to license new coal mines. And so to, to do, coal. yeah, th thermal coal or mac coal, Queensland's got a right. big coal endowment. Yeah. And to be doing that at the same time that you're like, oh my God, never have nuclear, it's becoming a more untenable position. I would think, you know, that's personal view, but I mean, I, I think- Well, I think you've got to bridge the gap there, haven't you, right? You, yeah. can't, you can't just suddenly go, right, we're, we've got energy, energy, energy. Uh, we're gonna switch half of this off. I haven't got a solution to fill the gap, but we'll, we'll get there in 30 years really uncomfortable 30 years right. for a bunch of people, right? So, you know, switching, which is why I think that COP26, the, the kind of negotiations there meant, well, we promised to get rid of it by 2050. You know, we'll get there, but we need a, a sensible interim period to last time to do that. I, th I think that was sensible in the end. Did well, you? for sure, yeah. Now, where this is really helpful for us is because we have, we have a project that's a very late stage project. It literally, we don't need to know anything more technically about it. We need yeah. to get the, give us the permits. Yeah. We'll get the money, we'll build it probably with utility contracts and go. Yeah. And so in terms of a binary catalyst that is very powerful without really spending any money, yeah. it's incredible for us because that's going to, you know, theoretically, it's a project with hundreds of millions of dollars in that based on pro studies that we've done and everything else. And at the moment, the market, in a bad market, what happens is people discount that down excessively. And then in a better market, the public starts the, and the and the street starts to say, well, it'll probably happen. Maybe it's okay. That's yeah. the probability. And so you start clawing back some of that yeah. PNAV, if you will, the ratio of PNAV that you're entitled to. And so I really haven't seen a lot of that happening yet. So I can't tell you, listen, our market's moved up a lot, but the whole sector's moved up a lot. Like if I looked at the us versus the same folks in the peer group at relative market cap wise, we've all kind of moved up. A, you're, you're, all, you're all up three times. Yeah. Off the back of what's happening in the market, yes, you've moved the projects on a little bit, but it, it, the market's on the heavy lifting, right? And that's fine, you said yes. it would, right? Um, and you get to a point where you can raise cheaper money to then move the project onto where it need, needs to be. You're, you know, let's say late development stage um, with uh, in the US, we're talking about, right? Should we finish off the Aussie? We're late in the US as well. Yeah, I mean, money wise, what happened with us is we, we're fortunate because we'd done financing earlier to pay for this U.S. project, and right. you know we had lots of warrants. Nobody did a nobody yeah. did a financing for ten years without a warrant. Yeah. So, yeah. lo and behold, all the warrants are in the money. So that effectively you're financed. So we really are fully financed through 2022 for because we don't really have a lot of spend because part of as I just mentioned, like our biggest catalyst, biggest value add is the the Queensland Premier having a three minute news conference and saying I've changed my mind. Who knows? Yeah. We, let's talk about Northern Territories because that, that was the. Just tell us what you're doing there because it's it, you, you, you're, you're going back on the, on the ground, but to what end? Oh well, no, we have a phenomenal greenfield thing. So just to refresh everybody's memory, or people that don't have, we don't have maps here in this presentation. Maybe you'll stick some in. Yeah. Um, so we basically have the whole belt. So we have the contiguous belt of what's a very um, prospective belt. Mm -hmm. Off to the west, we have another property that we bought from Rio Tinto. We used to be JV partner with them. We were very slow in getting the whole thing going, but we ultimately did all the airborne, and then they ultimately came to us and said, you know what, you're probably better handled to run this thing. Um, why don't you c carry on from here? But we had a big back end, so if we find a billion dollar discovery, they'll be back in the play potentially, but it allows us to develop the whole belt as, as a whole, even though there's a political border, the Northern Territory and Queensland to the west of that where we are now with the Greenfield thing that's never really been looked at, yeah. and why would you at $22 uranium anyway? 
But now it, people get excited about Greenfield exploration and we could make another Westmoreland style size discovery on that side of the line. People would get pretty jazzed about that, I think. And so we're, we're now doing it because the market wants it and because we're funded and because there's a logical series of things you got to do before you can go in there with a big drilling campaign. We're doing the next logical thing for the geophysics, which is we're doing a big geochemical program, ground truth and everything, getting set to go in there and drill in a meaningful way in the next field season because we're about to run out of the good field season in, the, in that part of the world with, in terms of the humidity and the heat and the rain, right. rainfall in particular. Right you can't move equipment around and things like that. So right. we're looking at probably April, May, June, we'll be in there with a the big program, but we'll also be back in there drilling stuff at Westmoreland that we kind of never finished up when the bear market started 10 years ago. So, cause Westmoreland still has expansion potential as well. I mean, ultimately, you know, that could be, it's 50 plus million out, 50 plus million pounds, right? Yeah. Okay, but, but it's, it's, tell me in, in a few words, cause you've got a few, you've got, a, you've got four projects, right? Um, we're, you know, we're, we're in the US with a couple, a couple of ISR projects and you've got the, the, the TN Australia. Is you, you understand how these markets evolved. You've, you've been been through one. You're, you're, you're one of the survivors. I think you're, a, well, I say, it seems to be, when I speak mm -hmm. to you guys, you call yourselves the survivors uh, of, of that. And you learn a few lessons there. You're seeing the way the market is evolving. Obviously, we're seeing these kind of financial th synthetic um, operators come in and just slightly change or supercharge or super boost th the speed at which this is going to move, which is good news. But you've also got to play it a certain way, right? You, you've got projects which are very far from being a producer, and you'll work those through the, the way that you know how. The ones which are nearer term, What's the sort of timeline? What's the process in terms of engaging with utilities? Because as you say, you know, once you've got that, you can go and talk to the money. Once you've got the money, you can actually start the thing. So it's quite a short timeline, as I understand it. Uh, well, the, the U.S. is a little different, Matt, because these ISR things, they're, the thing of beauty of an ISR thing is they're sm way smaller scale, but they're way less capex. Yeah, right. I remember. And so you can get a, I mean, our thing, we think we can get it up for 30 million bucks, a million pounds a year. And, uh, and the other ones, these restarts of these other projects that are on care and maintenance where they have plants and the well fields, they have to go drill up another well field, but it's very quick and very low cost effectively. Yeah. So those are much shorter timelines. But I, I, I'm in the camp that says, listen, if your aim is 50 bucks, I don't get why these folks aren't even talking about and why we would. I'm not sure we'd bother with the utility. I mean, we might. The, re the reason the utility relationship is valuable is because if you're going to be in business for a long, long period of time mm -hmm. and you have a big portfolio, you really want those relationships because right. when you have bigger scale, you're not selling four, eight, 12 million pounds a year into the spot market. Right. A, a single company that only has a million pounds of production though could sell a million bucks a year into the spot market like they should be able to but do it. Do you think that market will exist? Do you, do you oh, think? Of course, yeah, yeah. You think because obviously it, it used to be the case of you you want contracts and some spot and of recent times it's about as I read somewhere ninety percent of the last few years has been spot, which is a you know flipped on flipped on its head. Right. But do you think that will flip back the way things were? I .e. there'll be people will want given this supply crunch they see coming up, they'll want contracts, multiple contracts, never you know, meaning you know in it, which will be important, but contracts nevertheless. And spot utilities, uh, the yeah, for sure, utilities you're talking about. Yeah, there'll always be some kind of a spot market, but what there'll always be is there'll always be intermediaries. And I believe in, you know, do you think that, right? Okay, yeah, I believe in you don't think they're going to financial markets. And if there's out. an ARB there, they'll, the, you know, you could set up your own company to basically yeah. take the pounds from our mine at 80,000 pounds a month or whatever it be to make a million pounds yeah. and, and, you know, sell it to spot at a markup, why? which is kind of what was happening before. A lot of the Kazakh pounds. No, it's not the way it works. Everybody knew, everybody knew they were just selling them to intermediaries who sure. were shorting. And then that, that's, you could never get out of the doom loop. That was part of that. You asked earlier about people got frustrated because this whole thesis, they said, yeah. why isn't the market going up? Yeah. And, and Sprott came in yeah. and just said, I'm buying, I'm buying all, all of this by a week Tuesday yeah. and, and showed everybody how small the spot market was. And it's all gone in the spot market. But that's dry. what I mean. Yeah. It, it, it's, there's a brand new, a brand new horizon, yeah, right? New you know, those town, basically. New sheriff in town <laughs> yeah. and you're not on the <laughs> team. You know, you, they're going to be squeezed out and they're going to have to go and trade or find something else to trade elsewhere. I mean, it's it, probably a good thing. And these things happen in cycles all, all the time. But do you think that, I'm sorry, is there going to be a new dynamic that you guys are going to have to get used to? Well, as far as our, if you talk about a small project, I think all the people that have small projects, they can just pick up the phone and call, like, I've got a million pounds this year. Why don't I just sell it direct to Sput? I mean, that's sort of what right. the Kazakhs just did with this vehicle yeah. they created. They're selling yeah. their own stuff in there. Absolutely. Right. And creating another visible yeah. thing for, for the public to care about. It's a, it's a good yeah. concept for Asians. Yeah. I, it's a smart, yeah. smart thing to do. No, bigger, bigger projects are going to require 
real contracts with things to underpin the whole thing. And I think from a security of the business standpoint, from a standpoint of getting a brand new thing off the ground that takes a lot of capex, yeah. I think you're going to have to have meaningful contractual relationships with utilities. The one thing I would say that this market to me looks like it's shaping up differently than the previous one is, you know, a lot of the Western utilities are in flux. The Germans are probably out. You, just, you know, some of the other European countries are wavering. Um, you don't have the same depth of market maybe that you had before in the same number of players, but there'll still be a spot market. The, Ameri the American ones, to me, the American utilities look to me like the ones that are, that are really left out. They got to have to come up with a plan. See, they hated, they got, they've been through the whole in the, in the waves of nuclear buildout where they were the big gorilla. They've done all these things that these other nation states are doing now, including we went and bought our own mines, we had JVs in mines, they did, they, we had way too much inventory. All those things that all the other folks have done in the past, other nuclear states have done in the past, the Americans did that before. Uh, you know, like, and so I think they always thought the market would get deep enough and broad enough that they're sort of happy with their mix. We used to be, we'll do a bunch of contracts. Yeah. You know, so they're obviously the big one of the big players with a Cameco or somebody like that. Yeah. And, and there was a, the depth of the spot market was big enough that that would satisfy their market. But they, you know, they need fifty million pounds a year. It's a big number. But the, it, but it's not one utility needs fifty million. It's a diverse group of decision makers. Yeah, I mean, look, we we can sit and talk about you know SMRs being introduced yeah. to part of the utilities portfolio and stuff. And but but I want to talk about you, you guys. So you you said to me that you don't need contracts, or you feel that you could get away with not having contracts in place, but indeed in, because of the low capex, but instead go and say, look, we can sell this in the spot market. It's easy. Give us thirty million bucks to do our thing. And that would be an easy conversation to have, is that yeah. what you're saying? Oh, yeah. absolutely. It's okay. been done before. It was done in the last cycle. Right. Somebody did that. They built a thing and produced a million pounds a year and sold spot. Yeah, but you've also got kind of Paladin yeah. example of how not, you know they they were doing that. Well, and we, I, you know what I mean? So there's, there's examples of where it works and where it doesn't, right? right. So yeah. for you, you've got to wait till the, presumably then the spot market determines the, I don't know, what, three month moving average, six month moving average, whatever someone's going to need to see for you to get funded at what, 60 bucks? Oh, I, 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 I'm not thinking I about that. I'm not even thinking about that right, right. now. I'm just thinking if we're if but we're when do you press a button? If we're on this trajectory that it appears to be on the, mar the market, by the time we get the permits in place to be shovel yeah. ready, yeah. and you're worried about the revenue line and where yeah. it's coming from the first year, yeah, and maybe you do take some contracts because what would probably happen then is the utilities would be calling you. So, which would be a good thing. Yeah. But it's a small, it's, it, your project is about a million pounds a year, isn't it? No, well, yeah, a, a church rock is. Yeah, no, yeah. church rock is. But no, there's no chance we do the bigger Australian project right. like that. No, 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 no. That has to be done in a very deliberative way and with contracts. Yeah. And it's a lot of capex. And the, no, the, someone's, it's a $300 million project. You're going to have right. 200 million of debt on it. Obviously, those people are going to want. So the scale yeah. and, the, and the, the size or the lack of um, capex required or the de minimis capex required allow you to play it a different way, but you, the Aussie project is clearly more conventional. Yeah, and I think you could say make the same, I mean, that's my view, but I think you could make the same argument because we have a diverse suite of people in the developer group, the survivor group, whatever you want to call them, all these folks that have projects of some varying scale. And they're all different. I mean, some people have ISRs, some people have open pits, some people have Af oh, African open pits. Are you, because you, obviously we, there's a new entrant in here, uh, Consolidated Uranium, right? They're mm -hmm. looking to kind of do a little roll up yeah. of, you know, smaller projects. Have you been approached? We know them well. No, I know, I know the folks well, yeah. Have you been approached? Yeah, we talk all the time. We talk all the time. But are they interested? We talk about, we talk about uranium I'm things all going. the time. <laughs> <laughs> so can they? Is that something that they want to do? Do they want to pick up companies like you? Oh, I think right. But you're not interested. If they could do it on cheap, of course. I mean, but you'd be interested at the right price. Well, we don't work that way. <laughs> we have we, anybody. We 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 like interesting conversations with all kinds sure. of people, right? So, sure. is there is there is there a um, the, the, and I, we may have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. The problem that you have in M&A and uranium is, the, you know, there's Cameco and then there's, mm, well, there's Cameco mm -hmm. that's a producer. And then there's Kaz Adam Promo, I think is restricted to invest in Kazakhstan, which leaves you with mm -hmm. Cameco. And so you talk, talk about producers, there's very yeah. few actual folks now producing, I guess, maybe EFR when you get up to the, with some uranium yeah. and they might be a, a potential acquirer. And they have enough market cap and that sort of thing. Whereas I'm talking compared to gold, copper, other sure. lithium, even you're seeing deals in lithium where there's maybe there's a natural acquirer and, 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 and a natural acquiree kind of thing. Whereas in uranium, it's much more, we all sort of have the future. Yeah. 
But you also have a price on your head as well, right? As in the yeah. price you take today. And it's a question of, you know, conversations well, are always happening. You're inevitably taking someone else's vision of the future because you're taking their stock typically. No one's coming with paper cash, probably. Likewise, but no one wants yeah. to overpay today. So you've got to have a very specific view of what the future looks like and how you price that and any arbitrage you can make in, in doing it. Well, I think the, I mean, I think the price of the uranium is going a lot higher. I mean, we're six months into what should be at least a, I mean, give us a couple of years. We had 10 years down. You know, right. I can't imagine this. Do you think that's different? T- t- no, I just think, t- yeah, I can't imagine that anybody thinking, I'm talking to people who are thinking, I got to get off the bus because it's up three times. I mean, right. we're six months into something that was in a 10 year bear market and none of the underlying fundamentals things have actually changed yet. So that's, so, that's, a, that's a really interesting point and yeah. because, you know, the, the timing is everything. You know, we're investors. We need to sell this. Right. We need to sell the shares to someone. You got to get that. You got to sign that. There's got to be someone who still thinks there's value to be had, right? So you, you think that this has got a, like a, a, a two year road ahead of it before you even start to sort of see how valuable this sector could be in terms of the energy. I think so. I think you have, I mean, there's a couple of key catalysts, I think, first of all. I think you got to, because everyone's wised up that uranium's interesting, whatever. The thing that everyone's worried about, oh, what when they bring MacArthur? So I think they got to bring back MacArthur, mm-hmm. see how the market reacts to that. That's a big, chunky piece of supply coming yeah. in all at once, mm-hmm. probably with contracts. Um, and then let's see some of the first moves about developers that are really actually getting committed and they're going to start building something and what that does to the supply side. And maybe that starts tempering people's mm-hmm. expectations ultimately about where this could go. Yeah. But until then, I think I think you got a lot of runway. I don't think Sput's going to go away. And I think the thing that Sput's driving, because I think this hadn't happened, I think, the last time we chatted, I mean, they've now bought... Mike Alkin's ETF, right? And yeah. so Mike started with, he did a phenomenal thing and said, hey, there's a market here, all these little juniors, yeah, but yeah. this is where all the torque is. You know, the other the other ETF that existed had gone in a different direction. Yeah. And he's, he created the alternative to that with 3 million. It's 900 million under management now. And so, and that's a powerful driver because it's creating the same virtuous circle where they buy a few of the names and the names go up and people get comfortable because the names are up and they also trade, they're liquid, yeah. that you don't have in some small cap gold things. Like similar things we started you know, they were starting to buy it when we were 50 million market cap. Yeah. You, you, you don't get any gold buying by ETFs at 50 million a market cap, right? So yeah. it's a unique kind of thing with this uranium. It is. And I'm interested to see where that goes because, you know, not all of it's going to be real, right? Not all of these companies are going to do the things they say they're going to do. That, that's the interesting bit to this about how that plays out a la the last cycle uh, and obviously moving forward and where, where money decides to go. Because fundamentals are important, track records important, assets are important, and all of this. We shall see. Yeah, we shall see. Yeah. Mark, always a pleasure. Good man. to yeah. see yeah. you in the flesh. Yeah. It's wonderful. Um, you're over here at this conference. What, what are you expecting to get out of it? Uh, well, we're meeting some investors and catching up with a lot of people. I haven't seen a lot of people face to face in a long time so a lot of it's yeah. sort of people you hadn't expected to see and interesting and what's going on and right. yeah there were, i have to say there was a lot of chatter around energy and ener- especially the battery battery metals and all the rest yeah. of it i mean everyone's sort of get, got a link back to what that whole yeah. energy future and the electric future and everything yeah. else so i mean nuclear's kind of back in the conversation and you can tell cuz people don't have a good sense of it they mm-hmm. they want to kind of get everybody wants a well, where's the price going you know, it's a crystal yeah. ball thing. Like, who knows? Did you bring your crystal ball? I don't no, I mine at home. no, and I no, no. You just get it wrong anyway. So, yeah. I think it's going up. I mean, you're still. It's got to get at least. I mean, the thesis that we all talked about in the industry was it had to get to a price incentive price. Absolutely. So something new could get built. We're not there yet. So I feel comfortable saying until you get there, like, okay, ask me yeah. then. But I'm, yeah. yeah, we're going there wherever that is. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Interesting times ahead. Mark, good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. See you soon. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. All right.